Thank you very much. Thank you. Alex. Araf. Lovely to meet you properly. Um, I think there are some people here who will know what Sea Shepherd Global is, but there might be many who don't. What is the Sea Shepherd? Yeah, so Sea Shepherd is a marine conservation group. Uh, some of you might have seen Whale Wars or Sea Spiracy, uh, which touches on two of the periods that we've had in the organization. We've been around for 47 years, and we protect wildlife, and we do that in a number of ways. And what are some of those ways? <laughs> I kind of figured that, I figured that would be the next question. Um, yeah, so when we first started, we were a very small organization. We had one ship. Um, we're, we became bigger when we did the TV series Whale Wars, uh, which was on Discovery. Uh, I'm not a big fan of this series myself because it's a docudrama series. So, you know, they always wanted action and they wanted emotion and they wanted us crying when a whale was being killed, but you know, a lot of our crew is very dedicated and very passionate about what they do, and they're just focused on the work. So they didn't really like us as a TV series. Uh, they preferred to do the show uh, Deadliest Catch, which some of you might have seen, because the fishermen would always fight amongst each other, and yeah, there was no fighting on our ships. So we did that series for, I think, about eight years. Uh, I myself went down to the Antarctic five, five times. Um, we saved in total during 11 campaigns 6,000 whales, which was fantastic, of course. And, and it ended in Australia calling the Japanese government before the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And they won the case, and that ended Japanese whaling in the Antarctic. So, and when I spoke, to, I was at the court case in The Hague when it happened. And when I spoke to one of the lawyers uh, that represented Australia, he, after he won the case, he came to us and he said, you know, we wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for Sea Shepherd. So thank you very much for, you know, for bringing us here and stopping it. And then in uh, recent years, actually, one of the years that we expected the Japanese whaling fleet to go down to the Antarctic, we had our ships ready to go, uh, everything I hope that's not the police coming to pick me up. Uh, we had our ship ready to go, and then it turned out that they weren't going down south that year. So we came up with this plan to do something else. Uh, one of the captains, uh, Captain Peter Hammerstad, came up to me and he said, what if we go after the uh, Patagonian toothfish poachers that are down there? Now, this was an industry of uh, six vessels that were fishing illegally for Patagonian toothfish, also known as Chilean sea bass, which is a high sought out fish. In, in restaurants in the world. And we had this plan to actually find one of these vessels and follow them as long as it took to actually bring him to justice. It's a pretty wild plan, and we didn't know what to expect. Uh, and that vessel, uh, the first vessel we encountered was a vessel called the Thunder, which was the kingpin of the industrial, uh, the illegal tooth fishing uh, industry. This vessel had been fishing for a couple of decades, had fished tooth fish for in the tens of millions of dollars illegally caught, and every single time that law enforcement would get on their tail, they would change the name, they would change their registry, they would paint their ship, and they would elude justice every single time. So we decided to just simply watch them and keep reporting their location to law enforcement. So first day uh, we found them, uh, our other vessel uh, started pulling in the illegal fishing gear to gather the evidence, and so they took us into the ice to try to shake us. Now we followed them through the ice. Then they took us into a storm and tried to shake us. Not very comfortable, but we kept following them. Then we ended a period that we called the long wait, and they just sat us out and waited and see if we would basically give up the chase, and we didn't. This ended to be uh, the longest maritime chase in history. We followed the vessel for 110 days until the owner and the captain became so desperate that they sank their own vessel. And while the ship was sinking and the crew was being dis disembarking from the ship, our crew went on board the ship. We documented how they prepped the ship for sinking. They opened the hatches, they opened the doors, the water was coming in. We confiscated computers and hard drives and cell phones and charts. And, and basically, and a toothfish as evidence. And we handed it over to the authorities. So when the ship sank, we presented that to the authorities in Satoma, where the ship sank. And the captain was arrested, the chief engineer was arrested, and they actually ended up in jail. So, yeah, perseverance got us to that, to that success. Uh, but it was very interesting because 
We have some copies of the book Chasing the Thunder in the back. If you, I only brought three, so apologies, but you can get them online. Don't all get up at once. Uh, so the first come, first buy. Uh, it's a very interesting book. Um, six months later, after this vessel sank, our captain, Peter Hammerstead, got a call from the insurance company, from a insurance company, asking him if he had no, if heard of a vessel called the Thunder. So obviously our captain could tell him a big story about the Thunder, and it turned out that the owner of the vessel, who we didn't know, uh, was a guy from Galicia, Spain, and he put out an insurance claim for the loss of his vessel and the loss of the toothfish that he caught illegally. Now, obviously, that insurance money was never paid, but it shows the audacity of these illegal fishing vessels. They would just simply say, oh, yeah, just give me the money because I lost my vessel. And this happens a lot with, uh, with fishing vessels, unfortunately. They are being sunk intentionally when it becomes economically too expensive to, to maintain them. Uh, but, but this vessel was the reason why we ended up in Africa, and that's where we're, yeah, that's where we're focusing now our, all our work. I was going to ask a little bit about that. I think um, the chasing of the thunder and that 110-day kind of chase formed the first kind of inklings of Sea Shepherd Global's involvement with the West African countries and law enforcement as a priority rather than kind of the vigilante movements that we might have seen decades ago. So what are we doing these days? What, where has Sea Shepherd come to and what do we do these days? Yeah, what we came to realize is when we want to attack illegal fishing, and that's what we do, you know, we go after illegal fishing. If we want to stop poaching, then we have to look at the areas where the fish are. And most of those areas are in the waters of some country. Near the continental shelves are where the fish are. So we can go and do campaigns on the high seas, but there's not that much fish around, and therefore not that many illegal fishing vessels. One thing it might be useful to tell our audience is the idea of illegal fishing. When I... When I came on board one of the vessels, I didn't quite understand what that meant. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you could elaborate a bit about what illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing actually means. Yeah, it's a pretty broad term, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. Uh, it can be a poacher that is fishing illegally where it shouldn't be fishing, but it could also be a fishing vessel that has a license to fish, but is catching more fish than he's allowed to. Or it could also be a vessel that is targeting species that they shouldn't be targeting. I'll give a few examples. Um, about four years ago, we caught a vessel in Liberian waters. And, and let me first explain how these partnerships work. So we have signed agreements with eight African nations where we basically have a sea rider agreement. We offer our vessel, uh, we pay for everything, uh, we provide a crew, and we invite law enforcement agencies from that country on board our ship. So that could be Coast Guard, Navy, uh, fishery inspectors, park rangers, all of those. We invite them on board our ship, and we bring them out into their economic zone looking for poaching activity. And these are countries that, are, that have the political will to do something about uh, illegal fishing, but often lack the vessel resources. Uh, countries like Liberia, Gabon, Sao Tome, Gambia. And, and to give an example, one of the vessels that we caught about a little more than four years ago was a vessel called the Labico 2. Now, the Labico 2 had a license to fish for tuna in Liberian waters using long lines. So every time that you would see the vessel on radar or on AIS, you would say, oh, this vessel has a license to be here, so everything's fine. Upon inspection of the vessel, it turned out that they weren't fishing for tuna and they weren't using long lines. They were using deep sea gill nets and they were fishing for sharks. And on board that vessel was a hidden shark liver oil factory. Now, you know, of course, about the shark liver oil health capsules that you get. It comes from vessels like this. We could determine from the catch documents that we found on board from the amount of shark liver oil they would offload after each fishing trip that this vessel was killing approximately 500,000 sharks every single year. Now, try to picture that number. It's such a big number, 500,000. If you look at the global catch of sharks worldwide every year, it's between 70 through 73 and 274 million. The numbers range. And there's this one vessel that was catching half a million sharks every year. That vessel has been arrested, hasn't fished since, since we arrested it, which is more than four years now. So effectively, that one vessel, more than two million sharks saved. I think, I think the scale of global fishing is something that I hadn't quite appreciated until going on board and visually seeing the size of the catches, just one catch at a time, and the many tons of fish that have arrived on, on a deck. If that's going on year on year, catch on catch, 
the numbers are just astounding. Yeah, it's tens of thousands of vessels are fishing every day. So, you know, you look at the amount of long lines that are being put out every year and the amount of animals that are being called. And, and then, of course, there's the bycatch. Uh, two years ago, a vessel was inspected in Gabon, um, a shrimp trawler had a license to fish for shrimp. So when we inspected the vessel on board, it turned out that 0.2% of the catch was shrimp. 0.2%. I think this was my campaign. Yeah, you were on board that, uh, that campaign. So 99.8% bycatch, which is discarded overboard. So for one shrimp cocktail, thousands of animals were being killed and washed back into the ocean. So the waste is, is phenomenal. And when I thought about the idea of, we, we kind of normalized the idea of fishing, that ships can go out in the ocean and take, take huge amounts of yeah. ocean wildlife. And if that was on land, that would not be something that we would even think was okay. No, we would be, and we would call them poachers, wouldn't we? We would and be we protesting <laughs> immediately. But also, if you see the, the, the amount of suffering that is inflicted upon marine wildlife, it's, 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 it's insane. I mean, if it's something like that, what we're experiencing at sea, if that would happen on land with land animals, the way that animals are being scooped from the ocean, crushed to death, suffocated, if we would do that to land animals, we would never accept it. But for some reason, it is, it's perfectly fine with fisheries. And the way we talk about fisheries, you know, we, we objectify fish. You know, we talk about the catch in metric tons. We don't talk about individual animals. We talk about harvest, like it's corn. You know, we're talking about stocks. We're talking about seafood. We don't talk about sea life. It's actually a term I'd like to introduce. So next time you have seafood, refer to it as sea life, because that's really what it is. Just changing the angle a little bit, I think, um one thing I was thinking about before coming here today was reminiscing on my time on board. Mm -hmm. What's your experience of life on board one of these ships? Is it, is it a light-hearted, jovial kind of thing? Is it a, what's, what's your experience? I think it's, um, it's a life-changing experience, at least for me. I mean, I was lucky enough to uh, join um, our ship in the Galapagos Islands, where later I became the director of campaigns for six years, which is an amazing place. If you ever want to go, it's, I recommend it. Uh, I joined this ship uh, in 2002 uh, for a sabbatical. I wanted to be there for one year to break up my life. Well, I'm still there, so you know how that worked out. And I, I had this amazing first day. We sailed at midnight. Uh, we had bioluminescence around the ship. And in the bioluminescence, we had two dolphins riding the bow waves like ghost shadows. I mean, I've, I don't know if you know bioluminescence. It's, you know, animals that, live, that light up when motion is in the water. The combination with dolphins is quite rare. We had a, um, these kind of shock waves of bioluminescence going out, yeah, out at night time. And I think a humpback whale, it was the season for them at that time in Gabon in West Africa. Yeah. Me and the officer on, on the bridge at about 2 a.m. were just talking about the idea that this could happen. And then a humpback whale just jumped out the water in breach about 20 meters away from us, bright green. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if anyone's seen The Life of Pi, the, um, the film. There's a bioluminescence scene in that, and it was felt exactly like it was a dream, an absolute dream. Here I thought I had a great experience, but yours stops it, actually. And, and, <laughs> and Alex, no one believed us the next morning when we told them. Yeah. Well, my first day, let's see if you can top this. <laughs> After I saw the bioluminescence, uh, we were woken up at 7 in the morning because we encountered an illegal long line in the national park, and I jumped in the water and saved a turtle and two sharks from a long line. I saved three. Damn it! <laughs> Well, this is why life on board is so great. You know, it's such an amazing experience. You get to meet wonderful people, uh, people that are like-minded. We never met until today, uh, but, you know, it's like we've known each other for a long time because we share that experience. You know, being on board a Sea Shepherd vessel, I think is a, it's a really an eye-opener. You get to meet people with the same passion, with the same uh, mindset, and you get to save wildlife, which is, which is amazing. It's, 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 a, it's such a unique experience to actually make a difference because people always say, well, what can I do? How can I change? Well, you can do a lot of things you know, if, you just, if you just go for it. And having that opportunity within Sea Shepherd, I think is what makes it so special to become part of this organization. I was just wondering, I mean, not everyone will have the privilege of being able to get on board and be part of that direct action, but what would you say to our audience who, who want to do something from home? There's many ways you can get involved. Of course, you can be a land-based volunteer. You can, of course, you can join on the ship. You can become a donor. Um, there's also other campaigns that we invite people to become active in. Like we just came back from the Antarctic where we did a krill campaign. 
This is the second year we are doing a krill campaign uh, against the uh, industrial fishing of krill. A lot of people don't even know what's going on. We didn't know about it to the scale it was taking place until we read a study from uh, Stanford University in 2022. They documented the largest concentration of fin whales since the end of industrial whaling. There were more than a thousand fin whales in the Antarctic feeding on krill, which was an amazing sight. But in the middle of this feeding frenzy, there were seven krill fishing vessels. They were competing with the whales for the krill. So we went there in 2023, we documented it, and what we saw was far more serious than we thought it was. So they were actually targeting the whales to catch the krill before they could feed on it. This year we went back and again we saw it, you know, we got a lot of attention for this campaign. We had, last year we had the Associated Press on board and we're trying to get, the, to get CAMLA, which is the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, to actually protect the Antarctic by creating MPAs. Now we all know 30 by 30, we got to get 30% of the ocean protected by 2030. We're nowhere near that. So why don't we start with areas that are of critical importance, like Antarctica, where the krill fishing takes place. So what we ask people for this campaign is to become active. There's, um, there's three markets for krill. One is a, um, a health supplement, so omega-3 pills, krill enhanced. There's plant-based alternatives. They're actually cheaper than plant-based alternatives, so it puzzles me why you would even buy krill. And then there is the, uh, the salmon feed. They're using the krill to feed the farmed salmon because it turns the flesh nice and pink. And then there's krill-enhanced cat and dog food that is being marketed in China. So three industries that are completely useless. And they are causing a massive problem for the Antarctic ecosystem. So if we allow krill fishing to continue, then we, you know, we're going to see the entire e ecological, the entire food web crash in the Antarctic. So what we ask people to Go to your pharmacies, go to your supermarkets, and try to find these krill products and send them to us so we can then do a targeted campaign to stop this industry. One thing friends and family have talked about with me when I've talked about the idea of supplements and looking at the labels of food is sometimes you get the sort of dolphin-friendly or fish-sustainable fish sources and things. Yeah. What, what do we make of those? And where are the pitfalls in, in looking at those labels? Yeah, we've been asked many times, like, wouldn't Sea Shepherd want to give like a label of Sea Shepherd approved fishery? And of course, the answer is absolutely not. We'll never do that. But also, there is a risk when you're looking at labels. Uh, recently, we arrested a vessel that had a catch uh, um, shrimp on board that had the stamp uh, Friends of the Sea. Turned out it was an Italian-owned vessel that was being shipping their catch back to Italy with the stamp Friends of the Sea. So when you see it, you think, well, it's perfectly fine. It's got the stamp, it's approved. It turned out that they didn't actually have this certification. They just bought the stickers and slapped them on. So the minute you have a certain certification that you can use, people are going to take advantage of it. And that's the risk with these, uh, these certifications. I mean, if you want to be 100% sure that a fish is caught sustainably, you've got to catch it yourself. That's basically it. I don't recommend doing that, by the way. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I was just thinking about life on board and just there's a bit of, a, I guess, the type of people that we see on board and the diversity on board is something that's maybe quite different from other environments and other, you know, Navy and, and marine environments. Um, what do you think drives the, the kind of high influx of women, people of, people of all ethnic backgrounds, uh, kind of, gender backgrounds on, on board our ships. Why, why, why is everyone attracted to working with us? I think maybe because of that, because we do allow people, we do actually encourage people from all backgrounds to join us. I mean, we, we don't, if you look at the maritime industry in general, about 1%, 1.5% is female. If you look at our ships, we have between 30 and 35% women on board, which is higher than anywhere else on the planet. And not just people, uh, and not just in positions like, you know, where, oh, she's female, must be the cook, something stupid like that. No, we have female captains, we have female chief engineers, you know, we have the most top positions on the vessels. I'm not saying, by the way, that being a cook is a bad position, because I started as a cook on board our ships. And boy, the food is good. Maybe not, I don't know about your cooking, but well, when I'm, I was on board. I'm Dutch, so I'm not sure if you know much about Dutch cuisine, but... I'm pretty sure nobody ever said, let's go to that new Dutch restaurant we found in time. So, so I was quickly promoted to the bridge. Uh, 
So I guess I became a captain because of Dutch, because of my bad cooking skills. But no, the food on board is phenomenal. People, people think about the idea that they might lose weight when going on board and working for three months on a ship, but I came back significantly heavier. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, it's three, th three, um, three meals a day which are cooked for you, all vegan and freaking delicious. And there's so much of it as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very important. I mean, the most important thing on board is the food. And, and of course, we really take care of our crew because you're hardworking, you know, you're spending a lot of time outside, you're... But sometimes nothing happens, and then the highlight of your day is food. Because, yeah, that's... You know, the highlight just... of my day is food, even if stuff does happen. But... Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had in the Antarctic during campaigns, you know, you're looking for the Japanese whalers, and for weeks, nothing happens. So the highlight of your day is eating. And you do gain weight in those, those times, yes. There's something to be said for the fact that, actually, the campaigns, you can kind of glitz them up and dress them up as much as you want, but a lot of it can be... Patience, waiting, perseverance. Yep. The Chasing of the Thunder was obviously one sort of memorable example, but even that, there would have been days of nothing. Yeah, and with Chasing the Thunder, we had no idea how long the campaign would take. And the vessel that we were chasing the Thunder with, the Bob Barker, had a fuel capacity uh, that was enormous. So at some point, the captain uh, got a visit from the chief engineer and he brought his daily fuel numbers. And because we were in the middle of the, gr the great weight, we're just using the generators. And so the, the chief engineer told them, like, we have enough fuel on board to stay at sea for another two years. So obviously the captain called the chief cook on board uh, to the bridge and said, how much food do we have on board? Uh, are we, do we have enough food to, you know, to be at sea for two years? And the chief cook said, we have enough rice and beans to survive for two years. So yeah, that we never knew how long it was going to take. Uh, but the, the interesting part is when we had the opportunity to offload some of our crew to our sister vessel, the Sam Simon, in the middle of the chase. And the captain asked who wanted to leave the vessel, knowing that this could very well take years. It could take a year before this vessel would finally go to port. Only two people actually got off from the entire crew because they had to go back to their jobs back home. So it shows the, term, the, the, the determination of our crew on board. I think there's a bit of a running theme of people turning up for two months and staying for 20 years. Yeah, that happens, yeah. <laughs> so a, a bit of a warning, if you do join Sea Shepherd, uh, yeah, it's, it's addictive, it really is. Oh, well, I can't wait to get back at some point. Um, where are things going? Where, where, where are the next few years taking us? Yeah, so we're going to continue the partnerships in Africa. We have eight partnerships now. We're hoping to, um, to expand that into, uh, into other countries in the region. Uh, our ship, our newest ship, the Allen K, is now in Australia doing a tour, and it's going into the Pacific, where we signed an agreement with uh, Tuvalu, and we're really hoping to expand our work like we're doing in Africa in Tuvalu and into the Pacific. So we're really hoping to expand and catch more poachers. But it's, you know, we're, we're just a small organization. We have four ships. Our strength is not in shutting down all these illegal fishing vessels, because we, even though we arrested or helped arrest 95 vessels and counting to date, there's tens of thousands on there. So our strength is to show what's happening and to actually document these cases. And by showing it with documentaries like Seaspiracy, that people actually push their governments for a change and help create MPAs. So that's really our role, I think. Let's talk a bit about Seaspiracy. I was planning to bring it up earlier, I forgot. Um... What, what's, where did that come from? Where did that partnership with Seaspiracy come from? And is there more in the pipeline in that regard? Yeah, so Seaspiracy was done by uh, Ali and Lucy Tabrizi from the UK, uh, good friends of ours. They, they just started filming, and in the beginning we were actually co-producer, and then all of a sudden we got no more contact, and it turned out that Netflix took over. So we weren't too unhappy about that, because having a major documentary on a channel like Netflix has really helped. Uh, for us, for instance, our donations went up by 100% overnight. Our support base grew by 100% thanks to Seaspiracy. So every year we would, like, we would like to have a documentary like Seaspiracy just to show the people what's going on. A year later we had a documentary called Finn by Eli Roth uh, about the shark fin industry worldwide. But it was aired on Discovery Plus, which of course doesn't have the reach of Netflix. So it shows how important it is where you have documentaries. So, we're really hoping to have a big documentary on the BBC in the next couple of years, so maybe that's the next one. That's very exciting. 
where does um, where, we're talking about partnerships generally? I, I guess it's important to recognise who you want to partner with and the status, the ethical kind of moral status that they hold. What sort of things do you look for when you're thinking about partnerships, and, and are there any sort of exciting things planned for the future in terms of partnerships, maybe outside of the media world? Well, the partnerships, of course, is, 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 it's a model that works, that we wanted to replicate. Um, an interesting thing, development, uh, we're doing campaigns in the Mediterranean also with Sea Shepherd Italy, and an interesting thing happened there. We were asked to become official uh, fishery inspectors. Uh, by, sanctioned by the government. So some of our uh, staff in Italy actually did a course and is now a legally licensed uh, fishery inspector. So we can actually go out and arrest vessels. So we're no longer just working with governments, we've actually become part of the government. So that's a really interesting development and I really hope that we're gonna go and see more of that. Uh, we do have the knowledge, we have the experience, uh, we have the will to, and let's face it, a lot of, a lot of countries mm are simply not incapable of addressing illegal fishing because there's other issues that they're dealing with. Like, for instance, in Italy and Greece, their Coast Guard is more occupied with the refugee crisis, logically, and therefore they don't have time to address the illegal fishing issue. And that's something that we come in. So I really hope that we can expand that. Interestingly, when I was on board, quite a few of the crew members had had some experience working with some of the um, refugee rescue mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mediterranean organizations as well so I think there's a bit of a crossover in yeah. in terms of the activists and what what people are interested in working in so conservation of human life as well as marine life yeah it's, I think people are passionate about what we do and and, and just mentioning human uh, you know you, humans when we started doing these partnerships in Africa we obviously are focusing on illegal fishing but more and more did we realize that there is also the element of, of, you know, of, of worker abuse, of the way that people are being treated on these vessels. And we've encountered quite a few situations where you find the officers sleeping in the air-conditioned cabins and they have sanitary uh, facilities, and then the, the actual working crew, either from Asia or from Africa, are sleeping on deck in a makeshift tent, they're using a bucket as a toilet, and the conditions are absolutely horrible. In one vessel we boarded, they were sleeping above the smokestack, which is one of the hottest pl places on the ship. It was a place that was crawling with cockroaches. Uh, it was only about 60 centimeters high, and they were hot bunking and in, the most, yeah, in the most precise meaning of the word. Hot bunking means that you share a bunk with somebody else, you just share a bath with somebody else. There, it was actual hot bunking. That's how hot the, the bats were. So that's another thing that we're trying to create more attention for. And then, of course, there's when you're looking at, for instance, a country like Liberia, where you know, a country that's hit by two civil wars and Ebola, and a country that's just trying to recover from all that, and then there's these industrial fishing vessels coming in and stealing what little there's left of them. And we're seeing that by being there, by stopping illegal activity, that local fishermen who are going out in a dugout canoe, they're catching fish again, and they can feed their family, they can feed their village. So.